fun fact that you all out there might not know. Trip in high school had a Christian rock band, true story, called Fretless. Anybody here remember Fretless? <laughs> that was Trip's dad, by the way. <laughs> Hello, Homebrew Christianity listeners. This is Trip. We are at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Gary with hey! Lothar and Daniel Pugh. And this is the anniversary, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. This is the only protest where you drink in a church 500 years later. Yeah. Yeah. And since when has a protest been started by a celibate monk who then is like, never mind? It's like this, it's a very small collection of protests that start that way. And we're here to rock one with two not celibate ministers. <laughs> which is essential. We don't have to go into exactly how essential it was to Luther, uh, because I would get edited out. But, uh, thank you both for being here. Happy to be here, Trip. First time. Long time. Oh. <laughs> he, he paused like, I was thinking, what was that thing I say? They say it <laughs> on the radio. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Daniel Pugh and I have been friends a long time. That was the long time. That I know, I, I know. To, yeah. I know, but uh, yeah. you worked so hard on that joke that no one's heard before. I thought I would <laughs> help them uh, benefit from it. Um, Daniel and I have been friends a long time. And then when I, when I just moved back to North Carolina, I'm like, we gotta have, do something for the Reformation. And my dad says, you do know your best friend Daniel Pugh works at a Lutheran church. So I text him and he Imagine said, that. one of my church's spiritual gifts is talking about Luther with beer. That's true. That's something we're good at at Christ the King. Yeah. And, and then he says, and, uh, the only, only thing is you have to meet the coolest Lutheran minister. And, uh, and here we go. And, and he's actually from Germany, but that, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> you, when I was in German at Inlo High School in Raleigh, my German class name was Wolfgang. And I picked it because Perfect that name, I, it was Van Halen's name for his guitar. All right. <laughs> so, so first question for you, cause y'all have ended up on staff together and you got here by very different means. But uh, we're 500 years into a protest, and at what point did you say to yourself at, you know, 460 years in, 480 and stuff, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to join that protest. Like, when did you say, I want to vocationally be on Team Luther? Well, for me, that was actually kind of a coincidence, to be honest with you. I grew up Roman Catholic because I'm from the southern part of Germany. I'm from the Black Forest where pretty much everybody's Catholic, and I knew two Lutherans in... Uh, elementary school and I hated them because they got to go home at 11 o'clock when we had to stay an extra hour for religion. The priest would come and instruct us, right? And I didn't meet any Lutherans until I came to this country. I was 21. I had pretty much left the church behind. I had decided it was boring and old-fashioned and irrelevant and wasn't doing any of the things that I thought a church should do, like helping the poor and changing the world. And I came as a volunteer with an organization called Action Reconciliation Services for Peace. It looks a little bit like the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. They sent me to a place called Camden, New Jersey for 18 months to be a full-time volunteer on the staff of Grace Lutheran Church. And this was, this little church was the last thing that hadn't left the neighborhood in a very poor inner city black neighborhood. And very quickly, that church became the very center of the neighborhood, feeding people, doing community organizing, getting into affordable housing, setting up a center for homeless people. It was doing all the things that I thought the church should do. And so I fell in love with Camden and with the people and with the church and the Lutherans, eventually my wife there. And instead of 18 months, I lived in Camden for 35 years. <laughs> So when when you fall in love with those kind of enactments of the gospel and the people and the community, when when did the idea of becoming a vocational minister for uh, being in charge of the story, symbols, signs, and myths mm -hmm. that inspire that action, when did you want to be a steward of that? Well, that took forever. 
<laughs> I resisted that for like 20 years and was working in the church all along as a lay worker, as a social worker, as an administrator, always resisting the idea that I wanted to be a pastor. My wife was a pastor uh, all this time. I was kind of the spouse in the pew with the kids and all that. And then something happened. I can tell you when. It was... Uh, um, the Sunday after Easter in 1996, I was in my early mid forties and, um, my wife woke up and, uh, she had a terrible, terrible flu and couldn't talk. And she said to me, I can't do church today. You're going to have to do it for me. Well, that wasn't a big deal. I had been working in the church. I'd been preaching occasionally as a lay preacher. So I went downstairs at 5.30 in the morning to look at the text so that I could write a sermon. It's the Sunday after Easter. The text is the walk to Emmaus where Jesus joins the disciples mm -hmm. and they don't recognize him until he breaks the bread, right? Um, and so I, I called up my bishop at 5.45 and I said, Bishop, I know you don't like to do this, but today you're going to have to authorize me to, to preside at the Holy Communion because you can't preach on this text where the disciples recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread and then not break bread. Yeah. And so my bishop, who had never done this before and who was half asleep and who will deny the story to this day, <laughs> but it is true, <laughs> he said, okay, go ahead. And so that day I preached and then I stood at that altar and I said those words and I broke this bread and I fed the people. And I have to tell you, it's the most moving thing I've ever, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps wow. now talking about it. Yeah. And and I came home to my wife and I said, I want to do that again. And that fall, I ended up in seminary. That, that it would be a, a pretty unique uh, entrance essay for seminary. <laughs> Could you imagine being the professor that reads that and it's like, nah, nah. I don't. Yes. <laughs> You're like, yes, I want to be a Lutheran minister, right. but you know. I decided I want to do this while serving the Eucharist and uh, preaching in May the week after Easter and I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, <laughs> so the one of the things that, that that kind of perked up just in the way you told the story mm -hmm. is the way the the emotive response to the presence of God in doing your social work and community organizing and working there is connected to the emotive response to getting to serve the Eucharist and tell people, you know, your sins are forgiven. This is my body. This is my blood. Um, that type of real presence is something that Protestants post Luther kept trying to reduce. Yeah, but it's very Lutheran. I mean, yeah, Luther's the one who came up with the real presence, right? Mm -hmm. so. yeah. and, and for Luther, it was so much about honoring the mystery, right? That uh, communion was that God, that Jesus was in, with, and under the communion. Uh, he, not transubstantiation, but something that we don't have to understand in order to appreciate and worship and love. Mm -hmm. And that was the beauty of the theology. The the under part's my favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was at First Christian Church in Winston-Salem, uh, the disciples of Christ are very invested in the South in racial reconciliation. So when you come on staff at a church, you get paired with ministers from, the, from different ethnic groups that are in your region, and you get to know each other. And, and, and my mentor was more than twice my age, and, uh, and we had a discussion about... So is mine. <laughs> But it doesn't show because he looks really young. It's true. It's true. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, well, maybe I, he looks really old, right? Come on, guys. I mean, it is a podcast, so they can't see. But <laughs> if you have ever spent time up close with Brad Pitt and Wolfgang, there's a hey, blurring just, of the just lines. Just Google me; you'll find out. <laughs> uh, but w w we were discussing, and, and you know, the the, the three part presence when in, in Luther, and and he said, uh, and. And he goes, now you're a young minister, so your life might not have hit the fan yet where you <laughs> feel like an imposter and a fraud when you're holding the elements. But it's on those days the under is the most important because you realize that grace is the only reason you've ever been there, even Amen. if you didn't know it. Amen to that. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, I thought this was like a mentoring thing, not like like improvisational revival preaching. <laughs> but we were at a Waffle House, which is basically one step from the Eucharist table. That's right. In the it's South. An extension. It's an extension, yes. <laughs> well, but that theologically, that is an important point, and it kind of relates to my story. You know, the real present isn't just in church. Mm -hmm. The whole point is that church pre pre 
prepares you to then live out that real presence in the world because that's what ministry is about, right? If we don't make a difference in the world, we might as well, well, stay inside our churches, which is what a lot of Christians do. Mm -hmm. So, Danny, when would you say you encountered uh, the the presence of God or the uh, the mystery of God in ways that sent you on a passionate quest where you could end up here? I mean, yeah, my call story has a lot to do with my mom. Uh, we were in Who's a con- pretty awesome. We were in a conservative Lutheran church here in Cary, North Carolina. Shout out for Cary. What's Yay, up? Hey, Cary! And I was hanging out with Trip. Actually, uh, we were talking earlier today about uh, one of tri- Trip's uh, things was that he had to drive me home because I couldn't drive yet after Bible study, and he had to drive me all the and way play practice. to Cary. Come on, there and are play weeks. practice. There were weeks. It was five days. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I still owe you some gas money, I think. But for me, uh, my mom uh, had a a much longer call story than I did. But um, when she started seminary and uh, and I got to go, uh, she was she was away from us. She was in Ohio and I got to go see her and uh, open up her seminary books. And the first time I saw um, uh, the the Gospels right uh, in parallel. And the, and the first time that I could compare Gospels together w- with one of her books, I thought, this is for me. You know, this is what I want to do. And going to seminary for me was, I, I grew up Lutheran. I've been Lutheran my whole life. Uh, any cradle Lutherans out there? What's up? Um, for me, seminary was falling in love with Lutheranism all over again because um, it's not just 16th century theology. It's standing up for reform. It's for being for making all things new, as Revelation tells us, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that, to me, that's, that's why I'm here every day, right? That's how, why yesterday, um, I, uh, Wolfgang was uh, agreeable to this, but uh, we made sure that for the 500th anniversary, everybody could come up to these doors that you see in front of the sanctuary, and they could post their own theses, right? So that we're all part of reform all the time. And, yeah. and that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful movement to be part of. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, uh, I have a filter on Facebook comments on the Homebrewed website. I found that occasionally certain parts of the church like to give edifying remarks every time they discover some other church or some other religious figure will share about their faith and their theological reflection in the presence of high quality craft beverages and friendship and singing. <laughs> um, and, and Wolfgang, uh, I want you to know, uh, you have sparked some people's angstiness and then it sent me off to Googling and I, like, you're pretty hardcore. Well, actually, it's all Daniel's fault. <laughs> uh, to, we should tell you, listeners, two weeks ago, there was a story by Religion News Service that went all over the country that described us as a kind of a happening church where the Reformation is being lived out, maybe in a different way, and where lots of new things and out-of-the-box things are happening. And the reporter who didn't fine, fine job and really got it right describing us, attended one of Daniel's Bible studies on the book of Genesis. Because since when has the church had Bible studies on Genesis? I well, mean. and that was kind of out of the box and looking at it in, with new eyes and new ways. And uh, Daniel, in the process of this, became the new darling punching bags <laughs> of some of our brothers and sisters who are much more conservative and much more orthodox. It was the first time I've ever received hate mail uh, over the last 10 days. It was a new experience for me. Uh, but I knew what it was like to be Trip Fuller a little bit more, I think. <laughs> so you, uh, so the, I want to raise a glass to all the heretics out there. Oh, yeah, hey, heretics. Hey, cheers. Right. Morning, cheers. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Uh, uh, so the first time I got like a series of those, um, Rob Bell said, just hear them as misdirected prayers of encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so... Uh, but this was actually, uh, I swear, if your, if your hobby is going on Facebook threads and posting lots of links and saying horrible things, pick a new hobby. Um, Amen. I mean, these are all never unmuted. Uh, so no one got them, but they, they were very concerned that a, a person with a collar would get together in the evening to discuss theology, have a beer, and that you were an advocate. A Black Lives Matter, which is clearly a confrontation to the gospel. I don't, I don't get, connect all those dots. Um, because obviously they said... So this is something you read? No, it was on the comments for the event. For, for this event? Yeah. 
Some they comments. don't. They don't live in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I believe they live a previous place you served, and 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 I read it and I thought, dude, you only get gangster comments like this if you did something <laughs> cool. So, it's a. Well, it's worse than you think. You know, I served as bishop for the Lutheran Church in Maryland and Delaware, and I got defeated for my reelection by two votes, and some of them. Th- thought, some people thought that that was because I had had a rather prominent role when there was all this violence in Baltimore, when mm-hmm. the riots erupted in April of 2015 after the death of Freddie Gray in police yeah. custody. I happened to be the chair of the ecumenical leaders group, so I was speaking for pretty much all of the mainline uh, denominations and for the Roman Catholic Church at the time, and of course was interviewed and was in the paper and stuff like that, and um, we didn't really take sides the way we are being accused of, but you know, in the current uh, atmosphere and context in this country and the way in which uh, discussion and discourse in this country has really deteriorated now to name calling and tweeting bad things about other people as our president likes to do in that kind of atmosphere whenever you stick up for some justice issue you just get accused yeah. of all kinds of weird things right when you're really doing the right thing um, one of the comments we got on daniel's bible study was that Christ the King was now abandoning the gospel in favor of social justice. Well, you tell me how the gospel is not about social justice. Right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, how does your experience differ as someone who moved here, not interested in being a minister, become one serving the Eucharist and reading Emmaus, and then just doing the obviously love your neighbor as yourself and maybe even your enemy who voted for 45 uh, as yourself. <laughs> and like how does – what is it like coming into a, a, a situation where a lot of the energy, especially in the South, isn't yours, but Germany has its own angst and energy around around race, around right. power and of things. Of course, right. And maybe there is a connection to that. I mean, I, it doesn't make sense to me to think of the church as this thing that's somehow separate mm-hmm. from the world, right? I mean, remember, I left the Roman Catholic Church because I thought they were boring and not engaged. Yeah. And I found the Lutherans in the black ghetto in New Jersey because they were. And so to me, church is always about being engaged in the world. And I, that's what I like about Lutheranism. I'm not a Lutheran by birth. I'm a Lutheran by choice, precisely because Lutheran theology always drives us towards the world and for the sake of the world and to do justice and to help people in the world. I mean, that, yeah. And this was part of the, the genius that was Lutheran's, uh, Luther's theology, right? Precisely. Which was, uh, you can't earn your, uh, your salvation with God. All you can do is turn and love your neighbor, right? All that you can do is spread the gospel. And, and that's such a beautiful message. And, you know, as a Lutheran pastor, we can preach on grace week after week and it never gets old because telling people that you are loved no matter who you are or what you are or however God made you, and God is calling you to spread that love to the rest of the world, I mean, that's just timeless. It, it, it just it goes with everything. Mm-hmm. Can I give you an example? This, this is really helpful I, to me anyway. When I was in Camden all those years, as a lay person, not a pastor, I was always amazed how people in Camden always talked about how blessed they were and how God was in their life, and all that kind of stuff. They were so spiritual in a sense. And these are very poor people. Camden is the poorest city in the country. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from, right? They had substandard housing. The unemployment rate was 60%, and da-da-da-da, on and on. And they were all talking about how blessed they were. And I never understood that. And when I went to the suburbs, I did a fair amount of that to raise money so we could have our programs in the inner city. Nobody ever talked about God. It was all about church and the institution and the things we've always done it this way and the the sacred tradition and what we like and what we are comfortable with. Nobody ever talked about God. And I never understood that until in seminary, I sat in my Lutheran confessions class and the professor was talking with great passion about what Luther called the theology of the cross, which means that God always shows up in the place where you least expect him, 
right? Jesus is born in a manger, not in a palace. Mm -hmm. He runs around a poor country preacher, not some powerful military leader. He ends up on a cross, not on a throne. I mean, it's always the opposite. It's this upside down kind of idea. This, this, this paradox idea in Lutheranism. And I, I sat there and, and it just fell off my eyes and, and my, my, you know, my, my tongue was hanging out and I finally understood. Yes. That's what I had seen all these years was the theology of the cross in action, that yeah. God is always there and that God connects with us just when we don't think he's there at all. When, when we need him the most, he shows up the most, even we might not even notice it. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever thought about being a minister before, but uh, I think you could be pretty good at preaching. <laughs> I'll try. You should come to Christ the King and check it out. Yeah, Eight thirty and eleven every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so, what question should I ask each of you? So you can pick a question to ask the other one. This is like called the "Give the softball to your partner in ministry" moment. Oh, um, that's fun. Because because all the questions I have for Danny are incriminating. <laughs> but if you're interested in we mutual poor we life decisions, we weren't going to tell any of the old stories. Uh, right. not, yeah. not on the air. Yeah. Well, you know, costly grace only works. That's right. If you, if you keep track of uh, <laughs> why it's necessary. Well, I I think the question I would ask Wolfgang is, you know, why why is there a Black Lives Matter movement, Wolfgang? Don't all lives matter? Of course, all lives matter, and it's it's good to say that our lives do matter. The Black Lives Matter movement, though, was created in reaction to what's happening in the country when black lives are not mattered, when they don't matter, when yeah. they are not respected, uh, particularly, of course, around the issue of police brutality. And I mean, I don't have to get into the statistics about what it's like to be African-American or, or a person of color in this country as opposed to being white when you interact with the justice system and the the. Um, you know, police enforcement system. Um, and that's why it's important to honor the Black My Life movements for what it is, a reaction to the discrimination and the oppression that is going on. It doesn't take away from the fact that everybody's life, of course, matters. But then when you create an all-life matters movement, right, then you disrespect that and you somehow water it down. And as we have seen very recently now, uh, some of more... People who don't believe in equality at all have picked that up. Mm -hmm. And we've seen some demonstrations that are called All Lives Matter, that clearly the message was that not every life matters and that somehow white lives matter more than others. Oh. Amen. Yeah. If that was 140 characters, I would retweet it. <laughs> um, all right, so what question should so I ask I to, Danny? Oh, man, uh, uh, yeah. This is a hard one. I hadn't anticipated that. And you know, the problem That's is... That's the one that stumps him, by the way. I just well, want you I, to know <laughs> he can turn any question right. into a passionate sermon, right. explaining theory of a Luther, Eucharist, incarnation, right. maze, right. all that fine. Well, well, ask I, Danny a question. Well, I wish I had been on, on his candidacy committee. Then I could ask all kinds <laughs> of questions. But it's, I might not be sitting here today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard for me. Because, you know, when we called him this just this past summer, as the senior pastor here, of course, I was part of the call committee that interviewed him numerous times. And so we asked him all kinds of questions and tried to trip him up and tried to check him out and, and feel him out and all that and very much liked what we saw. So my question for you, Daniel, uh, would be, now here comes a long pause because I have to think about it. Um, but as you think about specifically our context here, Kerry, which is a town that is 75% white, 15% Asian, 10% African American with an increasingly Latino presence. But then we have a congregation here that is 90 plus percent white. And our denomination, the, the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, is one of the whitest denominations in this increasingly multicultural country um, what advice do you have for a local congregation that wants to be open to much more diversity in terms of race and background and sexual orientation and um, sh social and economic status and so on? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm just, I always say I'm just another white guy, right? Uh, I, you know, um, and, and for me, I went through anti-racism training probably four times 
And, and every time I got a deeper layer uh, of understanding of my white privilege, right? And you asked this question at the call committee uh, pretty much every time to see if my answer changed, <laughs> I, I think. Uh, and once you understand that that uh, racism and oppression are systemic, right? It's it's not one person to another person. It's how the whole system benefits some people and doesn't benefit other people. Uh, and that I think I think it's education, right? This is why I'm I've been infamous lately for Bible studies. I, I mean I think education is so important. I mean Martin Luther was a professor for goodness sakes, right? Mm-hmm. And the whole the whole Reformation started because one dude asked so many questions that they elevated him from being a monk to being a seminarian, and after uh, they elevated him to being a seminarian to being a professor, and then he still had questions, and then they excommunicated him. Right? <laughs> uh, I think for for so many people who want to do good in this world, so many white people um, who want to be part of a movement, they don't understand their place in it. I, I won't even say they. I don't understand. I didn't understand my place in the institutionalized racism. Um, and it took many, many sessions, um, and, and I'm still not there, um, poverty simulations and realizing what it takes to find aid. You know, we, it's easy for us to say there's aid out there for everyone, uh, but how hard it is to find aid, and it takes you all day, and it takes you away from your job and your family uh, in, in all the ways. Um, and that's why, you know, yesterday you can see up there on the wall one of the things I posted to the doors is that we have unity in diversity, that diversity isn't a bad thing. That's being created in the image of God is being created to be diverse. Um, that's why Paul says, you know, an eye and a hand and a foot are all part of the body of Christ. We don't have to be the same to be connected. Uh, and, and I think that's a powerful message that still plays. And Amen to I that. think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people who want to do good and don't know how to get started. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to them, I say, find some anti-racism training out there. Find a poverty simulation and just start there and, and see where that takes you, because um, Jesus is alive and well. And there's a lot we have to learn from the Gospels. And there's a lot we have to learn uh, about what it means to follow him on the way. So I just want to mention one more thing. I, I, I brought this book up here with me. Trip, do you re- recognize this book? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, Trip and I met in high school, and, and he invited me to do this Bible study, and I said, I can't even drive yet. And he said, I will pick you up, and I will take you all the way back to Cary. Those are his exact words. Um, if you come uh, be part of this Bible study with me, I was in 10th grade at the time. Uh, I was and- cool. I'd peaked coolness senior year <laughs> of high school. And in the book that uh, Trip picked for us to study was by a Lutheran. It's The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And this is the very copy that I flipped through all those years ago. And uh, I want to say thank you to you, Trip, for on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, you are part of the story of why I am a Lutheran pastor. So thanks, Aww. brother. Appreciate it. What what's crazy is that is that one Bible study has like five ministers and three PhDs in theology in it. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. it. There's just everyone has a period in their life where you you are an existentialist and a Buddhist. But if you have both of those periods between sixteen and twenty, and you with, find a group of like minded existentialists with, with liberal Protestants in a reading group, life just turns out well. <laughs> Amen. Maybe I don't yeah. know. Think think what? Danny and Wolfgang. <laughs> You want to see how you get a bunch of Lutherans to stand up? Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Glenn, where are you? Dr. J. Excellent. So uh, um, Dr. Jonas and Dr. English are both professors of church history and theology at Campbell University and were my professors in undergrad. Yeah, that means they, I pass, or I wouldn't uh, wouldn't be hanging out with them right now, and and so I came up with three three different ways of talking to them. First, I'm going to pretend to be a 19 year old in the introduction to Christianity, which is obligatory at Campbell University, because there's no better way to pass on the Christian faith than making people take student loans out to learn about the history of a religion they're ambivalent about. 
Um, but they aren't required to go to chapel twice a week anymore. Compel them to enter. Yeah. Um, spare the rod and or the grades. I can't even get a smile out of Dr. Jonas. I, I, I'm smiling. I'm I, smiling. I know. I, there's, there's always the, a smile internally. I, I, internally? <laughs> I haven't, haven't managed to get a Bruce Springsteen quote in for early enough. Um, so um, first I'm going to ask some uh, questions as a 19-year-old in a class. I will pick the 815 class if you still do those. Oh, yeah. Oh, 815, 19-year-old asking well, it's, questions. Well, for most students, it's 8 o'clock. Now, occasionally some will wander in at 815. Isn't that like when it counts as an absence? It's something like that, yeah. I just remember Dr. Ballard telling me that uh, missing 15% of all of the classes is a problem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. you got to come to class to get credit. I, I just feel like... You know, like you could have real presence without physical presence. So, and this, uh, the, this, by the way, is part of the conversation that we would have with a 19-year-old. I know. You know do I have to come to class? And, <laughs> do I have to come? Will to this class? be on the test? Yeah. Will this be on the test? Yeah. And then I have, then I have five propositions that I will state in as nerdy a way as possible, where they, well, they'll take turns going first. One of them will agree that this proposition, 500 years after the Reformation, is obviously true. They'll de- and one of them will defend it, and the other one will say, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. The fun part of that, of that is faculty members don't always get to argue and tell the other one they're dead 100% wrong. So there could be pent-up angst, competition, <laughs> things you don't know about that could get vented out. Or they could get stuck taking an opinion they absolutely don't agree with, which is the most fun to try to win an argument for. So, like, if I was like, you know what I'm down for? Plenary verbal inspiration. And Dr. Jonas was forced to take that opinion. It could be entertaining because of how many times he's almost stabbed his face hearing someone argue with him about it. Like, so he's got some really humorous shots. And then you all, as audience, will get to vote about who gives the most entertaining defense or affirmation of the thesis. It's a sheer entertainment. (laughs) Not like you agree with it. Like, if one's like, I like the planet and the poor and Jesus... And one of them was like, absolutely. And the other one's like, why? I read the Bible. Like, if the why I read the Bible is more funny, you can vote for that. It's a game. Just saying that up front, it's important. But they're both tenured, so it's all good. I don't know. You know Glenn Jonas and I spent uh, a summer doing a study abroad, doing the Lutheran sites in Germany. So at this point, we basically share a brain. So yeah, we, I don't know ooh. that we can be that. It's going to be hard. Which ones am I supposed other? to agree with and which one is my? No, you'll you're take turns. Okay. So okay. I'll say it. And then like if you first, you can say I agree or I don't agree. Okay. And whatever opinion well, you take. Him. No, that's not how the game works. <laughs> Look, I did all Whatever your... he says is fine with yeah, me. Absolutely. <laughs> Look, well, the syllabus says you take opposite opinions. <clears throat> And unless we as a class vote to dis, to change the syllabus, it's a contractual agreement under this <laughs> ATS certified degree. Um, <clears throat> and then at the very end, they're going to give us the question they think we should lose a little bit of sleep over thinking about 500 years later. And But these are not like questions and then you're like, ah, oh, I have some feelings. Let me talk about it. These are mic drop questions. Yeah. Where they're like, how much work? Could a woodchuck chuck. But about the Reformation. That's just a heads up. All right, so um, well, you should say just a, just a little bit about yourself because I just said one of you is a historian and one's a theologian. So uh, I'll be whatever Dr. Jonas says. He oh, be. he's going to tell you <laughs> what I'll you are. I'll agree to be whatever you want me to be. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, I've been at uh, Campbell about 15 years. I teach theology and philosophy. Uh, and so, you know, kind of cut my teeth on modern theology, uh, you know, kind of dating back to the Reformation. So that was really old stuff for me when I first got started. But, uh, you know, I guess since I have uh, continued to grow and learn, you know, I, I kind of keep going further and further back. And one of these days I'll I'll get far enough back to actually read the Bible. But, you know, until then, I just kind of keep working my way back in the history um, I disagree with that. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, I agree with him. So you're you're a church what, history professor. Yeah. What, what do you want me to like tell my story? Or? No, no, just a, just a frame of reference. Okay. Frame of reference. 
He's a Baptist church historian. Yeah, I, I he, uh, was, he was in charge of the religion department when I, I was there. Yeah, I was. Well, uh, uh, he was let giving let a class. What, let me tell you. Let me tell you what got me interested in Luther. Yeah, tell me. Um, I was a uh, I was a seminary student at a uh, very conservative Baptist seminary, um, and I was twelve hundred miles away from home for the first time in my life. I was uh, very young at the time. And um, I had a um, I had a, a very significant um, spiritual psychological crisis that hit me that first year of seminary, and uh, went through a lot of theological questioning. And and uh, in the middle of all of that, I took a I took a course with um, uh, W R E Step at uh, the seminary where I went uh, on the life and theology of Martin Luther. And he forced us to read Luther, and reading Luther helped me work through some of the crisis that that I was going through, because I realized that some of the same theological questions that I was dealing with were questions that Luther dealt with 500 years earlier. And I thought, you know, if Luther can work himself through those things theologically, uh, I, I think I can too, and and so that that that's where I fell in love with Luther. So that's what I'd say about myself. Yeah, when I was uh, do, he's not your minister. You don't have to clap for him. <laughs> um, I just have student loans to represent my time with uh, Glenn Jonas. Um, when in my PhD program, it was a joint philosophy and religion PhD, and so one of your qualifying exams, you have to pick. Uh, a modern philosopher and a modern theologian, and Luther was mine. Hmm. Um, and and uh, and I f- and I fell in love with him for something similar that uh, actually happened in your church history class, because my I, my my class, yeah, yeah, the, it's when it's when it started, hmm. because um, our I can't remember the actual assignment, but it was I had to write three pages on something, and we read the three treaties from fifteen twenty. Of Luther, and this is like Luther when he's spitting game. So, like, if you think of the rap game, so like peak Tupac, like you know, like in that that year and a half where he puts out three albums, and you know all the words, but I can't quote them right now because I want Danny to keep his job. Well, those three albums of Tupac in 1520, there are these three treaties, and we read it. And this is a little ugly red book. I'm like, this is going to be boring, but in the middle of it, I remember I asked you like, why would you spend 60 pages? describing the nature of grace because if you're a baptist preacher's kid that's like that's like your that's like your back pocket you're mm-hmm. like oh well, if the answer is jesus or grace not the holy spirit because that makes us uncomfortable and <laughs> um and then you your answer was you can't ask the question until you know why it bothered him so much mm. and 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 i and I remember thinking that was the first time I wrote a paper where I thought I under I sought to understand the context from which something came, mm-hmm. so that I then heard something using words that I'd heard and said, "Yeah, yeah, I like that." But now you had those same words that carried with it a level of force and energy you didn't get before. It's like the first time your partner says, "I love you," you're like, "She said what?" But then 15 years later, and she still says it, and you don't think she's lying, you're like, she knows what she got herself into. And that depth is there. And so, like, coming to go, like, where did the question that grace was so much worth 60 pages (laughs) came from was a quest. And that stuck with me throughout all my all my training. So when I had to pick someone from a period that wasn't 19th and 20th century dead Germans, um, I I went for Luther. Hmm. Uh, I don't even remember why I was telling you that story, other than to say you did a good job. I, I don't teaching. remember saying that to you in class, but but that's no, we had to write a little three-page thing on the fifteen twenty. I I was assigned the three treaties for fifteen twenty yeah. multiple times, and if you were assigned it and really hate it, I have an eight-page single-space summary of the argument <laughs> set in historical context. I've given to a number of divinity students to say, read this, then read it, because if you don't think this is important, don't yeah. be Protestant. Um, yeah. Sometimes I use hyperbole. <laughs> I didn't Lutheran. actually. Yeah, it's very Lutheran. You're like, you disagree with me? Ah, you work for the Antichrist. <laughs> yeah. I'm constipated. Um, so, 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 all right. My three questions 
I uh, came up with this, and y'all can both answer, or you can. Right, this obviously... is what we're supposed to agree and disagree on. No, no, no that's oh. part two. Part one is just the undergrad. Oh, okay. And I'm in intro to Christianity. It's eight o'clock, not eight fifteen, because I showed up on time because I'm so disgruntled about okay. reading this junk, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Yes, yes, you're. Oh, uh, Doctor English. I googled Luther last night. He's an anti-Semite. What's up with that? Like, why am I having to read this right now? And why do you want to have a party about it? And I'm underage, so I can't even drink at this party. It's like you, you are, you're covering up the anti-Semitism and not even letting me fully embrace the Luther. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, so you went right to, yeah, one of the, uh, I Googled it, man. I'm just looking for a reason absolutely. not to have to do this paper. <laughs> You found a really good reason, really. Jesus yeah. is not again. Jesus was not an anti-Semite. Yeah. Well, Luther was. Luther was a human being, uh, and you know that's where we. I would just say for any idol we have, whether it's a sports idol, a TV idol, movies, whatever it is, pol- political mm-hmm. idol. Uh, yeah, they're they're going to have uh, skeletons in the closet. They're going to say things that are very regrettable. They'll have attitudes. Uh, decisions you know that uh, that should bring them off a pedestal and and so you know i think that's also at the heart of luther luther knew he was a wretched sinner and i think the anti-semitic sayings bear that out that he 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 was <laughs> but so are we i mean so one reason to continue to read luther is because he speaks to the very human condition of recognizing our not just inadequacies, but um, our deep-seated self-destructiveness, that we do things that are not only harmful to others, but are are harmful to ourselves and to our relationship with God. Uh, And he had insights into that, and we should listen to them, and then also pay attention to the real human example, which, guess what, applies to everybody so absolutely, you, you don't ever want to cut that out and pretend like those anti-Semitic uh, portions were not there. Uh, you know that would do a disservice, really, to Luther's own message. Um, and so, you know, also keeping in context the historical context of, of where he was and you know other things that were going on. But you know, I would I would want to encourage him along those lines. Yeah, you're just gonna agree with him. Yeah, I I I, I do agree with him. I I would. Um... You know, I would just kind of add to that that uh, everyone everyone is a product of their era, and um, <clears throat> I think that we we should always use where we are in history to evaluate and critique those uh, that were before us. Uh, there, th- that that's why we study history. We study the the, the weaknesses and the mistakes and the faults, as well as the, the good things and the successes of people who went before us. But, um, I, I, you know, I think that we always need to recognize that, that people like Luther were products of their time. And that's not to excuse any, anything that Luther said that was quite harsh. And he said some extremely quite, he said some extremely harsh things about Jews and about Fellow Catholics and about the Pope and um, uh, and there's there's an extent to which uh, I'm I think most people of his day was were, were like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so so what do we do with that? Well, we 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 recognize that and we we recognize that for how bad and how morally wrong that is, and then we try not to make the same mistakes ourselves and we learn from from people we learn from people's uh human frailty and human weaknesses and and that's why it's valuable to read all of luther mm-hmm. uh, don't just read the good things that he said that you love read the things that really get under your skin and 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 irritate you and um so yeah. so uh um jürgen moltmann who's well i mean he's still alive but Second half of the 20th century, he's like one of the greatest hits of theologians. Um, the first time I interviewed him for the podcast. The Bruce Springsteen of theology. The Bruce Springsteen of theology. Thunder Road is the crucified God. And, there you go. um, 
Yeah. So, and in his recent writings on eco theology are like when he covers American Roots music, and the real fans really appreciate it, but the ones that are just tagalongs don't. And if you don't really appreciate the eco theology of Jurgen Moltmann, then you don't really understand the liberation theology right. that was really pioneered in the seventies in the early trilogy. So bump that. Um, <laughs> You got it's another true. lexicon. Yeah, yeah, if you if you follow your moment. Anyway, he said when I was talking to him about that, uh now he was a uh a failed German soldier in the sense that he like turned himself in in the middle of World War II, um which obviously our president does not like soldiers that get captured. Oh, yeah. Um which I feel like is a compliment to Jurgen Moltmann. Uh he also I've never seen him use Tic Tacs. But the uh Moltmann said the two things he would say is it's important when that question comes up to say Luther was wrong and very wrong, and to not highlight the errors of the previous generations, especially when they come to questions around race, anti-Semitism, this type of thing. Um, he said that is akin to the blindness of whites in America mm-hmm. around white privilege and race. Yeah. And the longer it's not okay to even say it, and that to be the first obligatory word out of a minister of the gospel's mouth, makes it problematic. Hmm. The second moment is to say, you might have been a racist parent, but if your grandkid calls you out, you didn't fail completely. Hmm. Because, yeah. and, 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 and Moltmann is, a, is good at quoting Bible verses for a liberal Protestant. Um, he, he said, you know, it, it runs the credo that runs through uh, the Hebrew Bible, says what? Like your sins are passed on for a few generations. But your righteousness for hundreds. And then sometimes if it's in an optimistic text, thousands of generations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that that perspective of history is something we have an opportunity to teach a culture that is so at this moment in reaction and hate and like, oh, what are we going to freak out about now? The left and the right. Let's find something to, to blow a biscuit about. And we just get all an outrage. There's a certain grace to saying, I know the ills I bear and name it, and also say, I hope my grandkids f- discover something new to speak over me. Mm-hmm. And that's not a failure if the generations that come later go, man, my grandpa just to giggle at racist junk. No, that means you've encountered the gospel more deeply and gave them permission to change their mind, to know they're wrong, and to call you out. And, and it's one of the the things I've thought about at this anniversary is how sad it is to think that the, the Reformation churches today have so atomized our ministry that multi-generational friendships and relationships aren't at the heart of the church. That more and more kids and teenagers and then college students have a catered experience to them uh, as they grow up. And they don't learn about crazy Uncle Chuck mm-hmm. and find grace for him while also trying to challenge him and to realize that he's a mirror of who you hope you are if you do a good job parenting. You know, I think <clears throat> the older I get and uh, as I'm aging through my 50s, this is something that I think quite a bit about. Uh, what will my grandchildren, if I'm blessed with them, and um, maybe even great grandchildren say about me fifty or seventy five years from now and 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 I think that no matter how much I might consider myself to be progressive on certain issues i I think that fifty or seventy five years from now it 's inevitable that my grandchildren and my great grandchildren will look at something that i 've written or or some story about me, and they 'll say, "Grandpa, how could you have ever?" And, and I, I think that it's good for all of us to recognize that about ourselves, that, that uh, you know, we, we can look back into the 19th century in the American South, and, and it, it's just so obvious to us that, that uh, chattel slavery was, was a moral evil, and how could someone have ever? And, you know, I, I don't know what the issues will be 50 or 75 years from now, but, but I think that we all inevitably might have grandchildren that say, how could you have ever, Grandpa? And and it's good for us to be aware of those things. So. Yeah, I, I just moved back to North Carolina, and my son, who was over there until he goes, 
can I go over to Jacob's house and play and you pick me up on the way home? Uh, and I was like, absolutely. Uh, w- the other day we were driving, um, his sister, uh, goes to preschool at First Baptist in downtown. And we're driving by the Confederate statue. Elgin, two turns later, is teared up. Mm. Now, granted, I grew up in the South, so I'm just like, obviously that's there. And if you asked me about it, then I could start to think about it critically. But to me, it's just part of downtown Raleigh mm-hmm. that I would go by with my grandfather. Elgin, what's wrong? <sighs> Dad, I just, why would they have a thing that says to our Confederate dead mm-hmm. when everyone that was walking by that when we drove would have been slaves? Mm-hmm. And it's next to the church. And he was like visibly emotionally hurt. Hmm. And, and I, and like that moment to me made me go, Oh, I wouldn't have thought about that Mm -hmm. unless I was like talking to Andrew about monuments. And it's like, Oh, now I'm thinking about monuments. No, blah, 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 blah. But -hmm. I wouldn't have noticed it. And he noticed people of color in front of that monument. If you asked me about the monument, I would have told you about weird stories my grandpa told that did not all line up repeatedly about that monument. Um, and about how you honor dead and the soldiers and all that kind of stuff. That's the stories that were connected to it. And he said after that, well, if we're looking for a church here, now we live here, it really needs to be one that is not okay with that. And so, like, one, I felt like well, I didn't completely fail as a parent, even though I completely failed as a Christian <laughs> by driving past and being like, why are you crying? We picked your sister up. Do you want to go to Bojangles? We live next to a Bojangles now. <laughs> but th- to me, I, I, I feel like it, it, it's totally, it, it's appropriate to recognize that. But then on an anniversary like this, there are also treasures that because of the neglect, especially in a culture that hyper nows, like mm-hmm. ours, like we're obsessed with the present, we miss certain age treasures in, uh, in the past. That's why the 19-year-old's second question is, OMG, like, he uses the word sinner and grace all the time. I don't even understand what that is other than the people on the TV, and they kind of creep me out. And do you have to convince someone they're a sinner before you can ever understand grace? And, like, ugh. It seems like a really, 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 really long sermon I didn't want to have to sit through. Like, what's the big deal? The questions are usually a little more concrete than that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I, sure what you're okay, I'll, 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 I'll tackle it. it. it you I'll, discuss I'll, the word I'll, sinner I'll, and gr- what, what does the word sinner and grace no. mean? Yeah. And what, like, how will you use them outside the context of the emotional, uh, personal value assessment, um, spiritual manipulation complex that is Southern religion? Like the word sinner and grace, he uses them as if they mean something mm-hmm. that isn't manipulating and, and it's not just like you suck and it's not like God hates you. Even though he says all kinds of stuff that if you edit out half of what Luther says, he's like the worst TV preacher. You put the other half in and he's just like, you can't handle the grace. <laughs> and so the 19 year old's concern. That he thought y'all were educated and had something else to say, but now it just, it, it it's reading like the Monday night Bible study that sat outside mm-hmm. Dr. Jonas's office and prayed for his salvation when I was there. <laughs> that story's been around a long time. Well, perseverance yeah. of the stories. Yeah, yeah. They were Calvinists. It was uh, a joke. It's one of them. You know, I, I, I think if, uh, and we've got, we, we've got some here, uh, Dr. English, Probably at the top of the list that that uh, know know theology a lot better than I do. Uh, but I think if we had Luther in the room with us tonight, and and that question were were addressed to him, he he might um, he might set up a couple possibilities, and he and he might say which which represents the stronger or more powerful grace. Which which of the two scenarios? A scenario that says. That uh, through the through the cross and through um, um, the death of Christ on the cross and His resurrection, the Christ event, uh, God 
takes our sin away uh, by grace, or the scenario that says that despite the fact that I am a filthy, rotten sinner, uh, God nevertheless accepts me into his or her presence. And, um, I, you know, I might would answer a student that way, and I would say, you know, Luther believed that despite all of the frailty, all of the weakness, all of the mistakes, all of the, uh, the evil that we have the potential to do as human beings, that God, through our faith, looks upon us and says, you're justified in my presence. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty powerful grace. That's, that's something worth uh, reading and reflecting upon. And uh, so I, I might answer the question that way. So that's that simultaneously justified and center concept that Luther had, you know. Which, yeah. which is one of the most, like, it seems like the most verifiable doctrine of all time. Yeah. Is sure. that you suck and are awesome. We don't like anyone that knows you well. Obviously, they think you're awesome because they're still your friend. Yeah. But if they're honest. You know, I, I grew up, the, the tradition that I grew up in, and then, then you know, when I joined the Baptist tradition, it, it you know, there's so many of the hymns, Jesus took my sins away. And um, it, it kind of gives you a false impression. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I think Luther is more correct here, theologically, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Uh, I, I remain a sinner, and I'm simultaneously justified despite that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly agree. Um, and to me, I mean, it seems to point out maybe one of the differences, if you're familiar with uh, Augustine, who also had a Augustine, <laughs> a tremendous wrestling of uh, of conscience <laughs> with the with 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 faith, and you know, this huge crisis, very similar to Luther. Uh, who kind of goes through this huge wrestling of um, destiny and and who is God and is God mm-hmm. for me against me? Am I worthy? Is there anything I can do? Uh, but whereas Augustine, once he goes through that crisis of faith and he, he has that resolved and he's able to his heart his restless heart is able to rest in that assurance of of grace mm-hmm. and faith in a way that I don't think Luther ever did or would have wanted to. Yeah. Um, so just as soon as as he comes to the simple answer of the faith, which is that you stand justified by no merit of your own, by no works of your own, but by God's pure and unmerited mercy, um, it's just at that point that he's thrown right back into uh, the drama of it mm-hmm. uh, because if if Christianity is is simple, uh, then we have certainly missed it. Mm. I and mean, that's what he really accused Erasmus of. You made it yeah. too simple. It, it's never that simple. He's just got this quote here, since God is one and true, uh, he is utterly incomprehensible and inaccessible to human reason. Therefore, his justice is also incomprehensible. I mean, as soon as you explain the gospel, you've destroyed it. Mm. And so for Luther, uh, you know, th- this is a king and a god and a judge who does everything and a savior does everything opposite of what you would expect. He, he condemns to save. He kills to make alive. Uh, he abandons uh, to bring us close. And so in a sense, God is always closest when he's furthest, furthest away yeah. and furthest away when he's closest to us. Uh, and he, I don't think Luther ever lost that in a way that, you know, Augustine and many other Christians have kind of resolved that crisis. Uh, Luther never quite resolved it, and I think mm. didn't want to because that was the heart of the Christian faith. Yeah, you know, I, I, I have a very good friend that um, <clears throat> loves Luther uh, like I do. Uh, and and he and I have some 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 something of a similar background, and and uh, he he would probably identify himself as either agnostic. I I don't know that he would say he was atheist, but um, but I, I talk to him a, a lot about things like this, and you know when we're together, and and um, I've told him on more more than one occasion that. You know, I really think where you are in your own sense of theology, you're you're probably closer to God 
than some people who think they've got God all figured out and, and, uh, uh, want to tell everybody else how they should think about God. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there, there is something to what Dr. English said that at, at, at the darkest moments when we think God is not there, those, those are, and that's what Luther discovered, that, that God is there in those dark moments. Um, so. Got one more quote, if you like, that would kind of tie into I, I this. I support quotes. You support quotes. Uh, <laughs> I got this, you know, he's just always full of great quotes, Luther. But, um, you know, to really highlight this point, uh, he talks about, you know, this is a stumbling block. Of course, it's a stumbling block. Common sense and natural reason are highly offended that God, by his mere will, deserts, hardens, and damns, hmm. as if he delighted in sins and such eternal torments, he who is said to be of such mercy and goodness. And I myself was once offended to the very depth of the abyss of desperation so that I wished I'd never been created. There's no, no use trying to get away from this by ingenious distinctions. Natural reason, however much it is offended, must admit the consequences of the omniscience and omnipotence of God. Uh, you know, so that idea that there's no use in trying to get away from this ultimate paradox of God's grace and our human sinfulness um, that somehow are, are being worked out in the eternal mind of God on the stage of history in our lives in my very heart right now. So, so what y'all said, I'm, I'm going to detour from my 19 year old because it, one of the challenges in doing confirmation for 16 to 18 year olds, a couple hundred of them in California in the last nine years is in the last 500 years, we've shifted from, do you believe in God? Is there another option to, do you believe in God? Ah, I don't know. What are you talking about? Maybe. Hmm. Like it, God has become a plausibility yeah. and not a reality. Even to those who have experiences where God becomes a very language they use to put on it. And teaching Protestantism to a group of students of affluent, overeducated people in Southern California, explaining Protestantism where you don't begin by assuming any of them actually believe there is a transcendent other meant translating the heart of Protestantism became a task. Um, so there are two different kind of affirmations that were our, our community values. If you're Lutherans, I'm sure you'll get where they came from, but uh, and one of them was the most true thing about you is that you're God's beloved. Now, when we read Luther, he's de- he he was obsessed with guilt, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, guilt was the primary problem that he's wanting to know if grace can deal with in a context where morality is not primarily given by a transcendent other that is essentially holy and such. That's not going to be the primary ethical category they deal with. Now, the feminist critiques of Reinhold Niebuhr and such have shown that shame and and violence towards the other rather than the the one who does the violence is actually a more uh, constant category for the privileged and underprivileged alike. But that shame actually is a bigger category for the existential experience of people coming of age in our culture. That you should feel worthless because of something that happened to you, (coughs) upon you, or that you were violated. That you are now responsible for being harmed, or that you're culpable for being the person you picked, and you're just the sperm that won a race and you had nothing to do with it. Or, and you can start to think of all the ways that you're, you were told ethically to deal with your experience shame of a happenstance you had nothing to do with, be it as a victim or accidental and such. And what I realized in doing it, uh, in trying to make Luther alive, is that the problem that we're dealing with in a world that is not, doesn't have a transcendent referent by, by nature, um, is that we believe scripts or lies in our heads are most true about ourselves. You're not good enough. You're not worth it. This is as best you can be, or whatever it is. You can imagine parents, ministers, friends, coaches, and all these things saying stuff. And then we give our identity to these truths that aren't true. 
And so when you go back to 1519, Luther has a sermon where he's preaching on the Eucharist, as he does. Um, and, and he talks about the Eucharist, and he says, um, the moment of the Eucharist that became power was discovered in the speaking of confession over my soul. Now, there's a long Luther debate about what this means, so we'll just skip it. But if you take that, insert a bunch of Finnish people and friends, then you get this moment where Luther goes, the Eucharist, baptism, uh, is like hearing the priest say after confession, your sins are forgiven. I'm not trusting the priest. I'm trusting Christ. And when Christ looks at you, bearing the scars, and says, you are God's beloved, your sins are forgiven, do you want to be the jerk that's like, nah, my mom says I'm not good enough and I got a B minus on that paper? I mean, that's really like how comical, like to Luther, there's a freedom to go like the most true thing about you is what the Eucharist, what baptism, what confession's about is that you are God's beloved. And the centerpiece of grace is shifting a script where that is the most true. And when that's most true, then I don't need my professors, who I dearly love and benefited from, to affirm my value and worth, or my partner, or my friends, or my culture, or my system, because my internal affirmation comes directly from God. And um, disagreeing with JC is above y'all's pay grade. And you can say that to everybody, friend and enemy, neighbor alike. And so, like, the, that was one part of trying to figure out how to tell Luther to people who have no... And then I go like, now, if that's true, is your life more beautiful? And everyone that sits there experiencing shame and scripts in their head that they wonder if that's most true goes, it would be more beautiful that my dad was wrong or my teacher's wrong or my friends are wrong. And the other thing that came up was that uh, the most freeing thing you could do is nothing. You don't have to do anything. You get to love your enemy. Because moral therapeutic deism, which is the religion of almost everybody, even the new atheists, um, imposes upon you ethical demands. And we have a whole culture where we virtue signal, depending on how you voted in different ways, that you are meeting these expectations and demands. But if the most true thing about you, regardless of what you've done, is you're God's beloved, then you don't have to do jack squat, but you get to. And then acts of justice and protest, or like taking out your headphones and painting with your daughter, or hanging out with cool people at a Lutheran church and drinking beer and discussing Martin Luther 500 years later, or any of these things are just pure gift. Because there's nothing that is needed that's there, so you just get to receive relationships and experiences and give yourself an justice and beauty and these things. But you don't have to. There's no economic relationship towards your value that's up for anymore. And those two sentences, we every year we rediscovered our values as a faith commu- as a, a of students. The people that went through confirmation become heads of it and then they come up with our new family values as a group. But those two stayed. And they were like me while I was doing my comprehensive exam on Luther. Figuring out how to explain it to people in a post-secular age. Um, that was a long diatribe. But, uh, but you know, we're describing that, and, I, and that's what it made me think of. <laughs> well, it's, it's in, the Lutherans could certainly uh, disagree with this, but it, it seems to me this is maybe one reason that uh, Luther was never overly concerned about outward forms of anything in terms of church practice, government, economics, family relations. Uh, the primary concern was the individual's relationship to God and God's relationship to that individual. And so matters of state, was he a Democrat, a, a monarchist, or whatever? I mean, all those things were just temporary conveniences. And either uh, the duke was assisting in the spread of the gospel and assisting in the kingdom of God. And if he was, then you should support him. And if he was, if he was not, if he was, if he was uh, somehow roadblocking the spread of the gospel and the kingdom of God, then you should oppose him. Hmm. And that kind of went with 
for everything down the line from state to church to family. Uh, where those things promote the gospel, they should be encouraged. But the very minute that they turn, there's no allegiance that is final or pure or uh, unchallenged. Now, you can absolutely turn on a, on a dime there. So you hear Luther sometimes supporting the state and then sometimes against it, uh, sometimes supporting kind of the institutional church and then again against it. Uh, and so I just don't think those things, kind of going with what you're saying there in one sense, uh, those things really matter to him because they were not inter- eternal. They had nothing to do with the nature or destiny of human beings. All right. So uh, we're going to play our game. Because is this where we agree? And disagree? Yeah, one, whoever answer you'll go first, Doctor Jonas. I'll go first. Okay. I agree. You're with the that. best looking, and, <laughs> and and Adam agrees. I agree. Uh, so you, you'll either decide for or against the statement, and you got 90 seconds to bolster it. Okay. And then and then uh, Adam's going to be like, "Au contraire, mon frère," because there's nothing more fun than sneaking a little French in. <laughs> I'm passing on the follow-up statement. Because uh, <laughs> Dr. Fast. Jonas agrees. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, then you've got 90 seconds to say, no, no basket. I'm not down for whatever it is you just took. All right, so thesis number one. An essential element of the Reformation was the printing press. So clearly, 500 years later, the technology that's going to reshape the future of postmodern Christianity is the tweeter. Hashtag 45 proves it. Oh, you ready? Yeah, you're either for or against that. Uh, well, in, in, in all honesty, that's something that I would actually uh, say yes to. I, I, I don't think that you can explain the Reformation without the printing press. And I... Several students out here, former students like you out here, that that uh, I say that in class quite frequently. Uh, the there there were other reform efforts before Luther, uh, in the century and a half before Luther, and you, you might ask the question, well, why did they not take hold the way Luther's took hold? And from 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 my perspective, uh, the 1450s with Johann Gutenberg and the invention of the movable type printing press, which suddenly made it possible for theologians to print their ideas and disseminate them all over the place much more easily, that's how those ideas got into the um, uh, into the culture. And so, it was it was the greatest technological development. Um, uh, it, at least in a thousand years, um, and it's it's on a par with the microchip or or you know whatever we want to uh, talk about today. Um, and uh, so so I I don't think the Reformation could have happened without the the printing the movable type printing press. I completely disagree with that. <laughs> That's uh, right, assessment. you do. The uh, for, for one reason is that the Vatican itself had uh, the. The first major printing presses, they had printing presses that could print in Arabic, in Hebrew, in Greek. They were also producing tracts at the same rates that Wittenberg and Luther were producing tracts. Um, they were also spreading the same, you know, spreading their, their views. The reason that Luther succeeded where others failed is because he had the political protection of Duke Frederick the Wise. Uh, there were so many people who wanted his head. And he had the protection of, you know, of the German people, of the German princes. And I think short of that, he would have been a quickly beheaded monk. Uh. No. <laughs> well, I, I, you, you no, know. No, no, uh, no, you don't have to respond. Oh, oh okay. It's the okay, way good. the game works. The we'll game, talk about it on the way home. Yeah, you can talk <laughs> about it on the way home. Next, next thesis statement, and Dr. English gets to go first. Oh, Protestantism converted the gospel into an excarnated commodity that functions as a solution to problems with a market solution. It's a tradition that has resources more ancient than the market with its rhythms and practices back into the history of the church. And yet that smell of the transcendent has been stamped out over Protestantism in the future of Protestant churches post-excarnation is a rediscovery 
of the smell of transcendence leaking around the corners of that tradition older than 500 years. <laughs> what in the world are you talking so about? You're trying to you're trying to say oh, yeah. <laughs> You're trying to say is the uh, did Pro- Protestantism set in motion sort of a, a secularism, a trend of secularism in the church? Yeah, this was the main. This was the main session from AAR's national gathering last year, which is why I thought of it. Is uh, you can't trust what those people say about anything. <laughs> well, that's why you, I get one of your opinions, and then I get the other opinion. I'm just trying to outsource okay. uh, outsource my thinking. But the way it goes, this is Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor. Yeah. A Canadian philosopher, he said Protestantism excarnates the gospel. Um, it comes out of its body, and then it, it then it falls victim to all the things of a of a market solution. Yeah. And that the future of Protestantism is a rediscovery of he says the smell of the transcendent, you know, outside the imminent plane, a rediscovery of Catholicism as a part of our lineage. So does the future of Protestantism also include a moving that birth marker back? Because every Protestant sect and denomination is like, well, here's where biblical Christianity started. We're minded, right. um, or or does it mean like leaving that leaving that marker there and, and directing forward? When you're going in the future, are you moonwalking? I got you. I got you. you know, you. <laughs> like that, or, or are you strutting on? Uh, you know, it, it breaks my heart, but the future of Christianity is not in the past. Um, there, we always tend towards nostalgic. Um, escapism. You know, we, we want, we would love to rediscover biblical New Testament church where uh, we all sit around in togas and uh, read scripture together in kind of some kind of kumbaya, uh, you know, heartland. But, um, you know, the, the future of Christianity is with the future of the world. It's with the future of human beings. And human beings aren't moving backwards. They're moving forwards into the future. And so the church is going to have to find ways to meet ordinary people where they are, not by trying to con- retrofit them and convert them back uh, 2,000 years into the past. Uh, you have to take this living Word of God and give it to a people who are hungry for meaning and hungry for a purpose uh, but it has to be put into words they understand. It has to be put into contexts that are applicable. And the Word of God does that. It, it absolutely translates into that. Uh, it, it meets us right where we are. And so whatever the future of Protestantism is, whatever the future of Christianity is, um, it's it's forward. Uh, you know, it's it's not, not behind. Well, what? I disagree. I was just anticipating you your desire for, yeah, for, for creeds. That's what I was anticipating. Uh, well, I, what I would, what I would say is that, um, I think there has been, uh, the, the, the transcendence of God that has been pervasive throughout the history of the church. And, um, uh, I think that as the church moves forward into the future, um, as it does so, it needs to have a healthy reflection upon how the transcendence of God has been lived out in, in ages in the past. And so because I, I will always, I'm a church historian because I believe that, that the past always helps to inform us of where we need to go in the future. So I don't know if you call that disagreeing with Dr. English or not, but I don't know. Y'all are very nice. I mean, given the reputation of Baptists, I really feel like there should have been another third and fourth opinion here. I'll try to state this one shorter and stronger. Peter Harrison, in his book, The Bible, Protestantism, and the Rise of Natural Science, argues that the Protestant refusal for allegorical readings of Scripture created or resulted in a flattening hermeneutic that was then applied to the world. That you start it just like the Bible had to be read literally. You start to look at the world, it's read literally. Descartes and friends, that means scientific uh, materialism. Well, in a world of science, religion, that in order to take it serious, text seriously must flatten them into a literal level, is stuck with a text they are saying sola about that can't sing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I um I think that there is always danger in making the text um I I I think there's I think there's always danger in making the text itself transcendent. Um I I think that we do our best uh when we're in engaging the text as the vehicle that takes us to the one that is transcendent. And so those who read the text only for the sake of the text, I think are, are, are missing the significance of what reading the text is about. Do you so, remember, do you remember your story about the, um, limo? About the what? Yeah. And the Bruce Biblical Springsteen? authority in the limo? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorite stories. That? I've reappropriated it on a consistent basis, but not with Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Mostly with Bono and the Edge. Okay. It works with Bono. Yeah. Um you you do you want me to yeah, tell yeah, it? Yeah. I, okay. Uh so so I do this thing in class about um the Bible, the authority of the Bible and, and things r- related to that. And and I say I always say that um you know, I love the Bible. I, I wouldn't have I, I could make more money in, in other careers than, than what I've been in, but I, the Bible is something that I've loved ever since I was, um, first started interested, first became interested in reading it. And, uh, but I don't, I don't worship the Bible. Um, and, and I think that there are, there are some who have kind of this docetic view of the Bible that, that, uh, the Bible is, is, uh, almost elevated to, being a fourth member of the Godhead, and 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 so the um, um, I, I think we make a serious mistake when we do that, and and so I, I always, I, you know, I kind of do some of this in some of my classes, and and so one of the one of the illustrations that I that I use is uh, as Trip has alluded to, one of my great heroes is Bruce Springsteen. I I love his music, and just um, in fact we ought to do a uh, we ought to do a thing about Bruce one night. But praise but, uh, the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but but that said, uh, I you know I tell the students, uh, uh, you know, wh- what if we're looking out the window of the third floor of Taylor Hall one day during class, and suddenly a big beautiful limousine pulls up in front of Taylor Hall, and and we we don't get very many limousines in Bowie's Creek, and uh, so it would naturally or just draw stoplights. Uh, yeah, well, that's we we have roundabouts now, and so. Um, I mean, we've tr- we've moved beyond stoplights. You transcended stoplights. Transcended stoplights. That's right. <laughs> but uh, you, you know, a limousine would naturally attract our attention, and so I would probably say, "Let's all go down and look at this beautiful limousine." And and uh, so we get down there and start gathering around the limousine and start admiring the limousine. And all of a sudden, the the driver's side door opens, and a chauffeur gets out, walks around, and. And, uh, we say, wow, look at, look at this beautiful limousine. He opens the, the back door of the limousine and out steps Bruce Springsteen. Uh, how ridiculous would it be for me to walk right past Bruce Springsteen and keep admiring the limousine? Look at the inside of this thing. Look, they have a bar in this thing. It's, look, you can, you have a TV in this thing, you know, and, and Bruce is standing out there and I've wanted to meet him for 45 years and, and, uh, so uh, that, that's sort of the way w- I, I think we ought to approach the Bible. I, I don't worship the Bible. I worship the one the Bible points me to. And so that's my illustration. Yeah. That's a great anecdote. I, <laughs> You're I, supposed I, to disagree with well, it. Well, that was a terrible, <laughs> terrible story. Um, <laughs> Is, I mean, I would make the, you know, the, uh, the Reformation connection here, of course, one of the great cries of the Reformation is sola scriptura, mm-hmm. uh, is scripture alone, mm-hmm. uh, over councils, creeds, uh, over ministers, opinions, doctors of theology, uh, you know, whosoever. I mean, that was the idea of it, that uh, this firm conviction that uh, if you open these pages and read them, God will speak to you, uh, just as God speaks to every human heart. Um, and if we had the wisdoms, wisdom in the eyes of faith, we could hear God speaking in the leaves of the trees, in the birds of the air, but we don't. We need this revelation. Um, but we'd always want to make the distinction that, um, you know, Augustine made, and go back to him again, and Luther is very Augustinian in many ways. Um, Augustine. 
<laughs> Surprisingly, Augustine and Augustine agree here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Strong coherence. There in the um, um, De Doctrina, between sola scriptura, scripture alone, and nuda scriptura, hmm. naked scripture, that Yes, we do have scripture alone. This is the heart and soul of our faith, but it's not a naked, mm-hmm. flat, literal text. Mm-hmm. What is it clothed in? It's clothed in the robes of Christ, the King. Uh, we, here we are. To, uh, yeah, the church. How this convenient. Right, how convenient is that, right? Shout yeah, out. He's just so, like, uh, we fit the just, church name in the yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the scripture is clothed in Christ. Uh, and so, absolutely. It, you can go to Walmart today and buy a copy of the Bible with your deodorant and toothbrush. Uh, but uh, in anyone who's semi-literate can, can read it. Um, and yet, it takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the clothing of Christ uh, to, to truly, truly hear that voice that's calling from the pages of Scripture. So it absolutely is the, the one inside of Scripture, the Word of God in the pages of the text who who is most important and has to be listened to. Mm. So Luther, Luther's kind of infamous for not being a huge fan of the letter of James. It was that straw epistle, and if he was going to edit canon, um, it might get cut out. So if you, if you were forced to either cut something out or add something to canon, what would it be? And I just want to, I, I don't want you to feel horrible about doing this we because, this. you know, huh? it, it could, I can, I can We've already it. talked about this. Oh, you have? I'm, yeah. Oh, well, praise the Lord. I know what Lord. you're going to say. Go ahead. You're going to say, I'm mentally, I'm mentally tele, telepathing right here. Uh-oh. Cut the book of Revelation. Yeah, absolutely. Add yeah. the Didache. There you go. Yep. Add the Didache. Cut That's Revelation. That's like the most Baptist yep. thing. You're like, add the early church disciple manual where... Uh, exactly. Adult baptism is right there. Yeah. And cut the one Baptizing with the Baptizing in cold water. Cold water. Because You'll remember your baptism if you're baptized <laughs> yeah. in cold water. Well, it's yeah. a, it's the same. But cut it's, Revelation would, because very few people have ever interpreted that book correctly, I, and it's caused a lot of damage in Protestant Christianity. Yeah, so. and cold water baptisms, if you're trading it for physical circumcision, oh. it's a it's an excellent trade. It's a good trade off, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so 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 now I'm going to ask one more question. Why you think of your question? You think we should all lose sleep okay. about? Um, so why you're thinking about that? Um, here's one that was sent in. We were discussing this in the uh, the podcast as a member group. So people that like listen all the time and stuff, and we discuss on Facebook, and uh, you know, they donate every month because they love me, um, or I don't know indulgence. I don't care. Uh, so. <laughs> We were discussing the anniversary and things, and someone said, uh, I would be interested in how you, un- how the fact that we can see lives with, f- lived fully that don't require a referent to God, whether or not you believe it's necessary or not. But like if you just go down the street, there's multiple religious traditions and people that don't need God to live a full and beautiful life. How does that change how you would begin to tell the gospel? And I said, well, I'm just going to ask Dr. English and Dr. Jonas because then I don't have to answer you right now. Well, when you, when you look at those people as you're going down the street, how do you know that they don't have God in their lives? You know, I mean, uh, I... Um, I think we, it, it's it's easy to look at people and judge. You've got God in your life, or you don't have God in your life. You don't worship God the way I do, therefore you don't you don't have God in your life. And and so I I uh, you know I I think that I might I might get you some hate mail for this, but but I think that we we all have God in us because we're all created in the image of God. And, and that's um, that's language that comes out of our tradition, which. In some senses, how you affirm the other, right? Like yeah. how a Christian affirms the other isn't to be like you're 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 a kind of a, a materialist that happens to enjoy your fringe. Um, like from your tradition, that's how it speaks. But I, like the challenge for me has been the like the come to Jesus talk at the end of all the chapels and at BSU and stuff like that began with a presumption that the telling of the gospel assumed a monopoly. Mm-hmm. That 
is just no longer viable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of ministers, intellectual Christians, people that have had experiences with people from other faith traditions or no faith traditions or the people that are like, ah, but I'm spiritual. Um, Those people have a level of generosity that would hear what you're saying. But I feel I feel like the church needs to have like a come to Jesus moment where then they say that future come to Jesus moments <laughs> take a different missiological stance. Mm-hmm. Like the pronouncement of the gospel does not make Christ appear. Yeah. It attunes us to the presence of Christ or something like that. Just where the dignity of the other should be the place we begin to tell it. Cause that's what Jesus did. Right. Like he didn't like roll around and be like, I didn't hear you say my full name. My name is Jesus Christ. That's right. Christ done. Yeah, but Trip, Trip, Jesus. I would think, you know, if we can be a little controversial here. Yeah, be uh, controversial. You know, this is where I think Luther would accuse you of being Erasmus. I'm sure he would. And, I mean, I have a philosophy degree. And boo on Erasmus. You know right? what he thought about philosophers. Uh, I mean, it, because Erasmus was more concerned with morals mm. uh, and... You know, that was his primary. Luther wasn't concerned with that. You know, he has that kind of brazen sort of statement. Look, you, you know, you're ridden one moment by God and then the next moment by the devil, like a donkey out of control. Of course, in his more kind of sober and sane moments, Luther said, well, of course, you know, the, the natural man uh, can practice the civic virtues. But, you know, Luther was never convinced those things mattered at all in eternity, that those do, they will affect your destiny at all, that no one is righteous, no one, no matter what you do or don't do, that that we all stand under that condemnation. Uh, And so, you know, for him that, you know, whether the person looks religious or not, or whether they're doing good or not, uh, that might matter in, I guess, the civic life. But before God, you know, it's it's hay and straw. Hmm. So, so here's that idea. I've, I've called this the post Hubble exhale. So, you know, like a Hubble space, space telescope. It's actually named after a dude whose name was Hubble and he doesn't own a peanut company because it just sounds like he should. Um, so like, you know, if we went back 75 years, we weren't really sure there were more galaxies in the Milky Way. So just pause for a second. Like, we're not talking about, like, when Luther was around, there's a, a nice, solid chain of being where there's, like, God, angels, obviously, us, and all the things we encounter if you rock out to all the uh, continents. Um, and not just our galaxy where there's, like, well, these other planets that people don't live on, you know, unless all the JFK files come out, then we obviously know fourth planet's <laughs> occupied. <sighs> but they won't even release that. If you thought about that? Um but post Hubble, it's just like, there's a bunch of galaxies. I think one of the best things we can do at this 500 years is have the post Hubble exhale. We've only been able to frame the beautiful doxological confession of the gospel in the context of a narrative that's like 5,000 years before us and one galaxy on a good day. Now, the experience, the mediation of God by Christ is still fully there and we can articulate it, but we can go, like God enjoyed dinosaurs for longer than human beings have been around. And there's like more galaxies than there are people on this planet currently. And just within the Goldilocks zone where sentient life could emerge, if the process of emergence is a transferable thing to all places with carbon life beings, and we can discuss that later if you want, I'm really into it. But like we should have a post Hubble exhale. We can fully experience, enjoy, value, and affirm the telling of the gospel we've experienced through the history of Israel, a person of Jesus, and the community that's called him the Christ, but not have to feel like we have to staple on a beginning and an ending that has an isolated point that is as narrow as Luther had, because Luther was more literal about Adam than Augustine and Augustine were. He wouldn't care. He wrote a book called The Literal Interpretation of Genesis where he gives pastoral care advice if you happen to have a congregate member who really thinks the earth was created in six days. He's like, now if they start causing trouble, you should tell them it's called mythology. But if they if they get out of hand, like you say something, otherwise don't worry about it. Um, But Luther was more hardcore. Uh, 
but like if we expand the beginning and ending points and don't trap how it works out into the particularities of our narratives, we can have an exhale and go like Dr. Jones said, like where you're like, who knows? God's already probably already been with them. If God is at least as nice as Jesus, don't you think God would have figured out whatever experience, narrative, encounter with nature, the other love and all that junk just to be like, what's up? I love you. Uh, you know, Trip, you're letting your process show. Mm. Oh, I've been known to let that happen on a consistent basis. But I don't know if anyone's ever tweeted hashtag post Hubble <laughs> exhale. I am uh, it's in a chapter of my next book. <laughs> post Hubble exhale. No, wait, what, what do you think? Like this, I'm, I'm really, uh, this is a, I, I actually think that, uh, one of the reasons Christians are consistently ignored is because Christians take particularities of their narrative that the person they're talking to that doesn't share it knows the only reason we're having this discussion with beer about christianity is because we were a sperm that won in one family like if we were in saudi arabia right now we'd be parsing very different sacred scriptures and talking about uh like bon jovi being a different character we don't want bruce springsteen you know to be to be brought into this but like 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 there that accidental part of where you're located does the encounter of grace, the gospel and stuff, is it discussing something that isn't as bound to the language symbols and signs of a tradition? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, those are great points. It's it just that um, we're each we're each products of our own place and time and parentage, and you know, we can in one sense do no other. I mean, this is where I think. Uh, you know, Bart gets it gets it right, kind of inheriting the Lutheran tradition uh, when he talks about the Bible that it is uh, it, it's testimony, and it's nothing more than testimony. It's nothing mm-hmm. less than testimony. It was nothing more than testimony, and in a sense, that's that's what we have to share. We always have to share our testimony. I, I can only tell you what God has done for me. I can only tell you how God has encountered me. Now, that does not negate how the divine has encountered you or how you have encountered the divine or your experience. Uh, but obviously I can't experience what you're experiencing. I can't know what someone who grew up in another place might feel about this, but I can tell you my, my task is to faithfully relate as a true witness um, what God has done for me. Mm-hmm. And I think if we, if we keep that, that humility, it is, I mean, it's the humility I, there is really the strength of the conviction. <laughs> well, I feel like you're like. I don't know what like, I have to say about that. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm, I'm passing like on. Horse Gump. I don't know. That's all I have to say about that. Life's like, I, life's like a box of dogmatics. I, I think that. Uh, it was a Carl Bart joke. Just uh, the, the more I think about uh, some of these things, um, uh, the more I keep, uh, you know, being drawn to the golden rule. Mm-hmm. And, and I was talking about this in, in, actually in my introduction to Christianity class today. Uh, I just think that as as we encounter people, um, whether it's you know sharing our experience with the gospel or whether it's um, talking with the clerk at the shortstop or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, just or whether it's talking about religious freedom matters or or uh, whatever, uh, if if we can just keep in mind that you know the way the way I'm going to respond to you needs to be the way I would want you to respond to me. And I just think the world would be a whole lot better place if we if we mm-hmm. just practice that. <laughs> yeah. It's so hard to do, but it's so simple to 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 grasp. The concept is so easy to grasp. Um, so all right. Anyway. So we're going to do toast to questions to lose sleep. So everyone stand up. The first question to lose sleep on who is the person in your life your tongue would stutter saying you indeed are God's beloved? You're asking that of us? No, no one has to answer it. This is what you should lose sleep off. You're thinking of Luther. The most challenging part of the God, of Luther to me is that the most true thing about you is your God's beloved. That's hard enough to figure out about yourself, but I'm keeping a list of people. I hope that's not true. And the goodness of the gospel says it is. And one of the, uh, Luther 
in one of his journals, attempts to write a prayer for the Pope, and he f- doesn't finish it and says, and let grace abide. So who is the person in your life where you, if you think of them, you could not say easily, indeed, you are God's beloved, and yet, dot, 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 let grace abide? To, to me, one of the, uh, the the most troubling, I guess, long-lasting uh, impacts of Lutheranism is uh, the priesthood of the believer. Uh, you know, if the entire responsibility for the faith falls on my shoulders and your shoulders, you know, I'm definitely going to screw it up. So, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I, uh, as I reflect about Luther, I, I, I think there's one aspect of his life that haunts me, and, um, uh, and, and it gets back to one of the things that we talked about earlier. How, how do we deal with the really harsh side of Luther uh, that is really difficult to look at? And, you know, he writes uh, against the murderous hordes of peasants and, and basically gives the nobility the the license to slaughter the peasants throughout Germany. And then he writes those just vicious uh, treatises about the Jews. And so he's got this, and then he's got the three treatises and the 95 Theses and these things that we just love about him. And, and so that's that will always haunt me about Luther, uh, how he could be so uh, two-sided. And then it makes me realize that I can be the same way. That haunts me. So, Well, thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Dana Wolfgang and the church, all for welcoming us here. Um...